thanks, I guess I better be good. I hear I replaced a movie. <laughs> you know, um, it's an honor to be here today. And what I'd like to talk a little bit is about, about is peer coaching and how peer coaching can help teachers adopt the kind of learning activities, the innovative kind of learning activities that are really going to help students develop the skills they need to replicate and go beyond some of the innovations we've hear, heard here today. So let me just start by saying that I listened to the talk about revolution earlier and sometimes I share those sentiments and sometimes I'm not quite as pessimistic. What I'd like to start by saying is that really clearly um, I have worked now over the last six years with educators from more than 30 countries. Educators, policymakers, education leaders, they all get that we need to change. They all understand that economic and social changes mean we need to change the way teachers teach and kids learn. They know kids need to have critical thinking and problem solving skills. They understand that kids need to have the ability to collaborate more effectively. And the kids really need something that we've never emphasized in the past, creativity. You know, whether you're in the United States and they call them 21st century skills, or you're in India where they call it holistic learning, they all understand that we need to do something different. And what's something different? Well, this quote comes from John Bransford's work, How People Learn. This is more than 10 years old, and you can see that these economic and social changes require us to rethink what's taught, how we teach it, and how student learning is assessed. So you're probably wondering, how have we done at these kinds of changes? And the answer is, not great. Um, most of you probably read a couple of weeks ago or heard on the TV or the radio that kids in Shanghai, China scored the best in the world on the PISA test. And well, in some places like the United States, this was a cause for great wailing and gnashing of teeth. And Americans said, wow, it's a challenge to our national greatness. If you listened a little more closely, the Chinese weren't that, uh, they weren't that happy about the results. Why? When you talk to their education leaders, they said, well, these test results are the result of too much memorization and too much test preparation and not enough focus on what's really important for the kids' future and our future, which is critical thinking and problem solving and creativity. How have other nations done? Really not much better. Some are somewhat better in terms of offering the kind of 21st century learning we're talking about. Most sort of where China is maybe a little bit better. Why? Well, look at the agenda that we focus on. Look at the change agenda. I mean, educators are all about change these days, right? You're hired for your vision for change. You're fired for your vision of change. But the reality of it is <laughs> what they're talking about is changing things that don't make a difference. The length of the school day, the length of the school year. We'll test kids more. I mean, come on. I grew up on a farm, and I'm going to tell you that we didn't get the cows fatter if the only thing we did was weigh them every day. <laughs> So what's missing? I mean, they're missing the fundamental point, which is what happens in the classroom between the teacher and the kid. A couple of years ago, the McKinsey Group did a study of the world's most successful school systems. And what did they find? That if you want to improve outcomes, you need to improve instruction. So let's come back to our fundamental question. How do we get kids involved in innovative learning? You have to prepare teachers to offer 21st century learning. How are we doing? Well, this slide, unfortunately, says a lot about how we're doing. We have isolated islands of excellence with no real ferry service. There's a great study of um, educational reform in the United States over the last 100 years. And, and the study says that the only people that really adopt the reform are those that are already intrinsically motivated. And that's only about 25% of all teachers. At the height of the reform movement, only 25%. So you might want to drill down a little deeper and ask yourself, well, why is this? Why only 25%? And part of the problem is that we really think we can get by on the cheap. Just last week, a professor at the University of Washington named Fink was quoted in the paper as saying, look, at our assumption is we can help improve the vast majority of teachers teaching with very little investment and training. So leaders are constantly saying to teachers, you must change, and by the way, figure out how to do it on your own. So 
Worse yet is the kind of professional development we offer teachers. We say to them, okay, here's your real opportunity for professional development after school or on weekends. It's going to focus a little bit on theory. You're going to have a tiny opportunity to practice what you learn. And you're never going to have any time for reflection or ongoing conversation with colleagues. That kind of traditional professional development, by the way, we've known this for 25 years now, changes teacher classroom practice less than 15% of the time. So, is there reason for hope? Well, this slide, I love this quote. Improving practice can be done by teachers, not to teachers. It's part of a growing body of literature that says externally imposed innovation isn't going to work, but empowering teachers is part of the answer. And I want to talk some about that research. And this is a great summary of that research. It comes from a study, it's a couple of years old now, it's called Professional Learning in the Learning Community, and it says that our educators need to work together continually, ongoing, sustained, intensive, or other words we've used, collaboratively. Michael Fullen, who's the dean of the School of Edu Systemic Educational Change, basically says one of the six secrets of change is connecting peers with purpose. That's collaboration. And it needs to happen where teachers work, focusing on common problems. Not outside of a school, but in the classroom where teachers work. So this kind of professional development can change instruction. This same study, by the way, said that typical professional development that I described a moment ago was episodic, was myopic, was meaningless. This kind of professional development the literature showing can change teacher classroom practice about 85% of the time. So, how have we done at putting this into practice? Mm, still not so great. A couple of years ago, I had this remarkable opportunity to work with 70 educators that were gathered from around the world because they were truly innovative. Because the learning activities that they had created and implemented with their students were judged by peers as truly being great 21st century learning. And I sat down with them and I said, so how many of you have had your project replicated by another teacher? Two raised their hands, two out of 70. We went a little bit further and it turned in both, turns out that in both cases, those teachers <laughs> that had their project replicated had it replicated by somebody that had helped create the project. So the essential replication rate was zero but we talked about what was necessary to get another teacher to adapt the learning activity for their classroom and adopt it. And they came up with a series of questions that needed to be answered before you could get teachers to adopt innovation. And they also came up with a prescription. What are the questions? Well, why would I do this? What's in it for my students? How is it aligned with my curriculum and the standards that I work to? What's the cost? In particular, what's the cost for me in terms of time and effort for me as a teacher. Who's going to be there to help me step by step through the process of adapting this and implementing it? Well, their solution, their prescription was, you need a trusted colleague who can serve as a catalyst. And they repeatedly said, well, what we need is a coach, a coach to walk us through this. Well, the roles coaches play a really nicely adapted to answering those questions and helping with the process. Those coaches co-plan learning activities. They might model a learning activity. Come on into my classroom and watch what I do with my students. And they'd reflect afterwards. And at some point, they may come and observe another teacher and say, well, this is what I really liked. And let's talk about how you can use this in other learning activities. And let's also have a discussion about what you might do differently next time. So these coaches, then, can be remarkable catalysts. Somebody said to me, this works better left-handed than right. I'm left-handed. That's not necessarily true. Based on my experience with coaching, what I want you to know is that expertise is important for a coach. Being an expert isn't. Why do I say that? 
Well, listen, the coaches constantly are working with teachers, and the teachers provide written feedback, and I frequently see it. And the teachers say, well, I really like learning with and from my coach. I really like the coach serving as a catalyst, helping me think about my practices, teaching, and improving. They don't ever say, well, I'm really glad somebody came in and told me how to do this. They don't want an expert. They want somebody to help them and actually to be a co-learner. So the other thing I want to talk about with respect to expertise and expert is that what it means is that on one hand, what you do is important, how you do it is even more important. You can't simply take a content expert, as so many schools are doing, call them a coach, send them into classrooms without any training. What kinds of skills do you need? Well, first, if you remember that last slide, it said we need a trusted colleague. Trust is critical here. What are we talking about? We're really talking about a situation where teachers come in on Monday morning and they ask their colleagues how their weekend was and how the hockey game went, and then they close their classroom door and never discuss professional practice. Teachers work in isolation in too many cases. So, by contrast, what are we saying? Well, let's co-plan learning activities together. Let's observe each other. Let's have somebody come in your classroom and observe you and critique you. Trust is critical. One of the coaches that I work with, Linda King in Yakima, Washington, put this better than anybody. She said, you know you're successful as a coach when teachers are willing to share with you what they know and willing to share with you what they don't know. So. These, lesson design, ICT integration, communication and collaboration, these are all skills that are critical for successful coaches to have. Let's go back to the question of how they use them again. So we're co-planning learning activities and we're talking about lesson design. Coaches need to know what strong and effective learning looks like. They, they're not there to support traditional instruction. They're there to help kids develop basic skills and 21st century skills. But they also need to make sure that it isn't just them telling, they need to work through a process to help the teachers that they work with adopt the same shared sense of vision, a norm, if you will, about what effective instruction looks like. Without that shared sense of vision, you're in trouble. You know, what might this norm look like? Well, kids are involved in activities that I actively engage them in learning. Kids are involved in activities that are fun or encourage creativity. Kids are involved in solving real-world problems and trying to convince others to adopt their course of action. We're going to hear a speaker in a little bit. It's going to talk about that kind of learning activity. So, they have to help create this norm. And then they have to help implement it. How do you implement it? Well, you don't implement it by standing there as a coach saying, listen, I've been doing this for 43 years now. I've been wildly successful beyond all of your dreams. And this is how I do it, so just do it like me. Aside from the fact that that would destroy trust, there's one other problem here. As coaches, we have to constantly balance advocacy, telling them what to do, giving them the answer, versus inquiry raising questions to get them to think more deeply about their practice. If you start giving them the answer too often, you've shifted responsibility from the teachers to the coach. So advocacy needs to be balanced, and you should almost always come down on the side of inquiry. What's inquiry mean? It means using these communication skills. If I point this your way, by the way, duck. I blinded some of the spectators the last time I used one of these. Communication skills, like paraphrasing or, or probing questions. So a teacher's working on a blog with their high school students. The kids are writing for a blog, and it isn't going so well. And the coach says, well, what you've told me is that the, you're not happy with the results you're getting. The kids are writing largely for you and other students in the classroom. Have you thought about ha the value of having them write for an authentic audience, a real-world audience outside of the school? That's a probing question that gets teachers thinking more deeply. Now, these communication skills are not only critical when you're co-planning, they're essential when you're reflecting. I mean, somebody else is inviting you into their classroom and you're supposed to critique them? 
it's important to use these, these communication skills then and really err on the side of inquiry versus advocacy. But you also need collaboration skills. You might want, for example, to use a protocol that structures the conversation in ways that might seem artificial to you at first, but really keep the conversation focused on the learning activity, not the teacher. So you're keeping the conversation focused on what's important. So does coaching work? Yeah, it does work. We see in evaluations all the time that coaches, the teachers that work with coaches say we're doing activities that require problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration. Kids are, teachers are more routinely integrating technology. It's not a silver bullet. It really isn't a silver bullet. It doesn't work overnight. Teachers are taking small steps from traditional education to 21st century education. But they continue to take step after step. And that brings me to my last point, which is if you think about where we started, how do you implement vision? How do you bring innovation to schools? Teachers need success implementing the learning activity based on the vision in their classroom with their kids before they're going to embrace and adapt the vision. And coaches can help do that. Thanks so much.